Thank you, Anna. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm excited and uh, uh, nervous. I, I'm, I can't wait for the end of this talk, but okay. <laughs> Let's go. So this is uh, about uh, computation uh, with the brain. Uh, it's really about the brain. And as you'll see in a second, let me tell you, what, what, what is it, what, why am I giving this talk, right? So um, the question is, how does the mind emerge from the brain? And by that, I mean, you know, all these complicated things that we do, uh, perception, cognition, language, um, reasoning, planning, storytelling. And uh, the brain, I just mean the substrate, synapses, neurons, very well-defined, well-studied processes that we get to do better and better understand. So one way to put it is that despite accelerating progress in neuroscience, really fantastic, breathtaking work, and much, a lot of it being done here too, an increasing insight in cognitive science for centuries, an overarching theory remains elusive. So it's not like physics or um, bi even biology, where there is a broad theory that sort of explains almost everything, or you could potentially explain almost everything. Here, it seems like it's missing. Um, and so why, why should I say it? Let, let me tell you what uh, one uh, a neuroscientist, the, uh, 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 a Nobel laureate said, we do not have a logic for the transformation of neural activity into thought. I view discerning this logic as the most important future direction of neuroscience. So this was a, you know, it was like a call, you know, uh, great to do something here. So what kind of formal logic would qualify as Axel's logic? Right? Uh, please feel free to interrupt at any time, especially if you disagree with me. Um, so an early theory was put forward by, by Valiant, and it's called the neuroidal model, and this will be a source of inspiration as we go along. Um, but let's see, what are we looking for? Uh, first, I want to say we're looking for a computational system, and you might ask why. Here by computation, I mean something quite universal, uh, anything which has well-defined state and rules for change of state. So we can, we can think of planetary systems as, as computational systems in the sense that you know where the planets are and then the next second or the next instant, they might be somewhere else because of they're following some set of uh, 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 state rule patterns. So that, that's all we mean by computation. It doesn't have to be on your laptop. Um, consistent with the current understanding of the brain. So the system should not violate what we, we already know to be true and it should explain cognitive phenomena. This is what we're looking for ideally. So if you do have such a computational system, you know, it should have some kind of data types and operations. So what are these? This will be part of it. But there's another question we have to ask. When we think about computation in the brain, what's the right level at which we should be thinking? Or it's useful to be thinking. Do we want to think about the whole brain where, where we do see phenomena? Do we want to think about spiking neurons and synapses, which certainly we can study very well and there's very interesting activity. Even lower, dendrites, fantastic studies coming out showing how dendrites compute complex functions of their inputs. Um, molecules, you know, there, there's stuff going on right at that level um, or somewhere in the middle. So with the assembly calculus is, is, a, is a proposal for this missing theory. <laughs> okay. And uh, it's a formal probabilistic model of the brain. It has only one basic data type, okay? Um, it, it has a few elementary operations, so it'll be a handful. You'll know them all by the end of this talk. Uh, it has a completeness theorem, so it'll tell you something like whatever can be computed can be computed in this model. Okay, so you know you're not missing out. There's no um, FOMO. Okay, and it has a killer app, which hopefully is language. Okay, okay. So um, the talk is based on a few papers. I'll just put them up here, but of course you can find them online. Um, several of the authors of these papers are in this audience. Uh, you'll see pictures later, and maybe you just want to figure out who they are if you're bored with the talk. Okay. So um, in two slides, I'll tell you the whole model. Okay. So this is not a model that requires a course to learn. It's a model, it's a two-slide model. Okay. So what is the model of the brain? There's a finite number of brain regions. Okay. So finite means maybe a dozen brain, brain regions. Uh, each of them will contain n neurons. N is a parameter. Now, obviously, they might, n might be different for each region, but for the purpose of the kind of studies we're doing, it won't matter. We'll just say every region has n neurons. Okay. Um, now, there will be two very important uh, uh, mechanisms by which everything operates. The first one is inhibition. So in each region, only k neurons are allowed to fire at any time instant. 
the neurons fire, you know, and the, and, the, and the mechanism will take to be the most common one, which is that if the total input is above some threshold, the neuron fires, and uh, 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 only k are allowed to fire. K is some number smaller than n. Okay, so k are allowed to fire at each time instant. So this is inhibition, and indeed there are, uh, you know, we, we know that there is this large population of inhibitory neurons in, in, in our brains, uh, whose, whose entire purpose is to regulate firing activity, and when there's too much firing activity, they go, they start firing more, they put it down, and this, this regulates very quickly. Um, we can discuss this more, uh, but the, the way we'll abstract this out is just to say that only K fire. In fact, it converges very quickly to a very stable level, but, but let's not worry too much about that. So that's one part. Each area, only K neurons are allowed to fire. And then there's connectivity between areas and within areas. So the neurons within areas are connected. How? From one area to another area, there are directed connections. And we'll just model them as random connections. So the, the, between any pair of neurons, the one in area, say, A and another in area B, there is a probability of a connection, which is this parameter P. Okay, with probability P, there is a connection. Now, again, these probabilities could have been different for different pairs of areas, sure. For the purpose of this model, we'll just say it's P everywhere. Okay. And then each area is recurrently connected, so internally connected, again, by directed synapses, same probability P. This could have been different too, but let's just call it probability P. So all connections are directed. Each pair has a connection with probability P. This is true within areas and also between some pairs of areas, not necessarily all. But remember, there's only a, a constant number of areas. So that's the whole uh, hardware, that's the setup, okay? And I've told you one part of it, only K allow, allowed to fire, and here's your second slide. Neurons fire in discrete steps. This is, of course, an assumption to, to, for, for purpose of trying to understand this. Right? There, there's a time clock, and every second or millisecond or whatever, there's some top K neurons are firing. Which ones? The ones with the highest input. So this is the model. So it's not in an area, every neuron receives input from whoever was firing in the previous step, each neuron look, looks at its weighted sum and the top K fire. Now you might ask, how do you get top K to fire? Well, that's what the inhibitor neurons do. You know, when, when there's too much excitation, they start firing, regulate it down. And so you, you stabilize very quickly at the level of whatever threshold you want by, by, by adjusting the firing rates. In fact, when we were working on this, I was wondering, this could only work if um, the, the, the inhibitor neurons actually integrated faster. They operated faster than the excitatory neurons. And I tried to think, could this be true? I sent an email to one of our colleagues here, Bilal Haider, who's here, and he responded within a day saying, yes, they integrate five times faster. Here are two papers. Okay, so uh, that, was, that was nice to know. Okay. Uh, uh, anyway, so the, these top K are, 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 are selected to fire. Uh, and the connections between the areas don't always have to be on. They can be inhibited or disinhibited, okay? Within an area, they're always on, but between areas, they can be inhibited or disinhibited. Okay, so that's, that's that part. The, the second important thing is plasticity. And we'll use the simplest model of plas Hebbian plasticity, which is if a neuron I fires, and in the very next instant, the neuron J fires, then the weight of the synapse IJ is, is multiplied by a fixed one plus beta parameter. Again, beta could vary between areas, beta could vary depending on the environment and so on, but we'll just say there's a fixed parameter beta and, and, and the weight increases by one plus beta if J fires right after I. Okay, that's the simplest model of Hebbian plasticity. Okay. There's also homeostasis. So if in this model, all weights keep going up, right? So we also have homeostasis, which, which comes in two forms. Each neuron periodically, doesn't have to be very, at a very fast rate, make sure that the total sum of weights into it is, is, is at most somewhere. It just puts it all back down, okay? And every synapse goes down at an extremely small rate, you know, so that there's very gradual forgetting everywhere, okay? That's the whole entire model. Any questions about the model so far? Because the whole point is everything we say, all computation from now on will be emergent. There will not be no algorithms. There will only be what happens if I present this model with some inputs. Yes. So you're Exactly. So the end neurons are all excitatory. We've completely abstracted away the inhibition as saying it allows the top K to fire. In fact, there's a population of limited neurons for each area. Simply.
Any other questions? Great. OK, so just to relate it back to, you know, if, if you're a real neuroscientist, then you might want to say, OK, what do these parameters look like? So if I'm thinking about something like the medial temporal lobe, we're talking about maybe 10 million neurons, you know, and, and the cap size 1,000 to 10,000 neurons are firing out of this, about square root of n. The synapse probability is pretty small, one in a thousand. And uh, the plasticity is also pretty small. That one is a little harder to measure, but this is some kind of average that, that I've been told. Um, uh, and so the main ideas of the model are randomness, selection or inhibition, and plasticity. The basic operation is just this random projection and cap. Random projection because the connections are random and cap in the sense that only the top k fire. Um, and, and there's an online simulator, so, so you can try that out if you prefer. Um, so the next thing I want to ask is how realistic is it? Let's just, you know, because I'm sure it's on the minds of some people at least. It's reasonably so for a formal model of the brain. We I don't want to give up on the rigor or the formality just to make sure that any conclusions we draw are actually valid for the assumptions we make. The, for example, the discrete steps assumption is certainly unrealistic, but it's likely giving us a good sense of what happens because modeling the fact that changes are more continuous is, is going to be harder mathematically, but hopefully doesn't change the phenomenon we come up with here. Um, plasticity and assemblies are used here in a rapid time scale, which may not always be true. Um, so, as, so roughly speaking, this is a, appears to be a productive compromise between being totally real to experiments we know and being rigorous. Okay, so back to the question. What is the basic data type? Something larger than a neuron, smaller than the brain. Okay, now that we have this hardware model. And so this is uh, what, we, what we call an assembly of neurons. Okay? So uh, uh, something that's been in neuroscience for a long time since Hebb in 1949, let's propose them. So what is an assembly? An assembly is a large and densely interconnected subset of neurons. Um, and uh, the point is that they fire together or in a specific pattern to represent some object. So it could be whenever you're thinking about something, it could be a memory, a concept, a person, you know, a name, a word, it, it, it's your basic data type for memory, okay? Um, uh, it, it, it could be a combination of things, you know, so um, uh, right now, as I speak, you are creating an assembly for the notion of assembly, okay? And uh, forgive me, you may not forget it, okay? Or it might be a while, uh, okay? So, so this is what's happening. So assembly is the subset of neurons, which I haven't told you how they're getting created, but once they're created, they will together fire or fire in a specific pattern, and that corresponds to you thinking of recognizing or or or, or somehow triggering this 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 memory. Yes. Yes. Right. So at the moment, we're, we're assuming that every brain area, top K fire, every step. External input, other firing activity will help determine which K, but every, they're, they're, they're continuously firing top K. So whatever's current top K will determine the next top K and so on. Oh sure. So, so we start off with some random random firing perhaps or or external input. I mean we haven't yet come to external input, but external input comes from uh, a neurons in a sensory area, call it a sensory area, which will be turned on because of external factors. The neurons are initiated Right. Yeah. Great. So that's uh, that's uh, that's what an assembly is. And uh, more recently, Busaki, uh, uh, um, whose lab studies them quite a lot, uh, calls them the alphabet of the brain. And he, he has a book on assemblies. And um, you know, they, they we're now at this point where, unlike when it was first proposed, where people can measure these things, and we'll see a couple of experiments. They can see. In fact, we had a talk. Was it last spring? Where it was measuring assemblies of neurons in response to specific activities uh, uh, by, 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 by mammals. Yeah. So, okay, so that's, that's what an assembly is. This is going to be the data type. So it's familiar. Okay. But now, what is the assembly hypothesis? 
that this is the intermediate level of brain computation. Let's call it the assembly calculus. I don't want to use algebra, it's more loaded, but it's just an arbitrary choice. It is implicated in higher cognitive functions, such as all these. And uh, assemblies of neurons are its basic data type. That's the, that's the whole hypothesis, okay? Um, so what are its operations? So here are the operations and we'll, 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 we'll go through them in detail. Project, which means basically taking an assembly in one area and projecting to another area. Could be like from a sensory area to a more longer term memory area, okay? And, or, or, or making, just making a copy for whatever reason, the brain wants to make a copy. Seems to be a critical operation. Second, associate, um, which means, uh, you know, when you see two assemblies, two objects, memories firing together a lot, or uh, associate, then, then the corresponding assemblies start overlapping more, okay? Um, association, pattern completion. You see a part of the assembly firing, and if the assembly is strong enough, very soon it fills out the entire one. Um, merge, this is more complicated and seems very important for language. It's the notion of two assemblies creating another one, which represents both of them together, but also has reverse connections. It, this final one is able to activate both of these. Think of the noun phrase and a verb phrase forming a sentence. And the sentence is able to activate both of these also. Uh, reciprocal projection, a simpler version of merge, and a few control commands. So this is, this is basically going to be it for, for, the, for the operations. Okay, so now let's get to something more concrete. And we'll start with, uh, you know, um, a, a lower level, how uh, fruit flies remember smell. And this will allow us to get to, pro uh, to, to project. So um, we're looking at the smell of the, the, the uh, olfactory system of the, of the, of the, of the fruit fly. Uh, odor is a, is a whole bunch of odorants, right? Types of molecules. They come in and then uh, there are these odorant receptor neurons which fire, which are like zero one. They fire if a particular odorant is sensed. That's it. Just like you have in the eye, you know, fire if you see a particular pattern in this region. So uh, and there are about 50 odorant receptor neuron types. And then depending on what fires, that activity goes on to the next level to these, uh, to these uh, 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 um, uh, canyon cells, where, which are about 2,000 of them. There is a random connectivity graph here, okay, random in quotes for now. Um, and then in these 2,000, basically it's a winner take all or top cap, take cap operation, where the top 100, the 100 receiving the highest total inputs will fire, okay? Uh, and that's it, that, that goes to the higher level, higher level brain of the, of the fruit fly, and, uh, and that, that's its notion of smell for this, whatever it says. Okay, so uh, this is not just fruit fly, it's other insects, similar things. Uh, now, what is happening here? If you assume for a second that this graph is in fact random, the connectivity is random here, the neurons here are getting a random combination of whatever is firing. A lot of them are zero, but some are firing, so a current combination. And these are all basically independent random combinations. And out of those, you're taking the top K. Okay. Okay. Uh, so, you know, if you take independent random combinations many times, it's going to start looking like a like a Gaussian. Oh, this this, this but I mean, yes. Yeah. Just a clarification question. So the, the mean centering operation, is that over time or over round? Right. Um uh uh what's observed is 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 is, is over time, yeah. Okay, so mm. you're just going to more high That's it. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so this is not in. This is all. This is this is what uh, they they say is observed by the by, by, by yeah. Okay. So and then what you do is you take just the top, the highest of these, right? The 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 top K, so this cap. When I mean, you have this Gaussian shower and you're just restricting yourself to the top K, everybody else is zeroed out. Okay. Now, um, there's a question here. Sounds good. Before we get there, why should we believe this is random, right? I mean, it's presumably it's at the birth of the of the fruit fly, but why why is it random? In fact, <laughs> there's a paper that studies this carefully, and up to up to a simple statistical test, it looks like a random graph, except that the distribution of the degrees on the left is not uniform. Some odorant receptors have higher degree. That, you know, you see them more often than others. But if you give me the degree distribution on the left and a uniform distribution on the right, it looks like a random graph. 
connectivity graph looks like. Okay, this 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 was I mean this is an empirical finding. So what the, what, what can we say about this theoretically? Let's look at the left side. This is the odor receptor side. This is the Kenyan cell side. Then some subset that fires correspond to a smell. As a result, there's a top K that fires here. And then there's another subset that fires, let's say, a different smell. And then you get a top K here. Fine. OK. Here's a question that comes up, and it seems to be important later on. Suppose these two subsets, the two smells, share a certain number of odorants, some fraction, an alpha fraction. What can you say about the resulting caps on the right-hand side? You would like those to overlap as well, because then the fruit fly has a sense of, oh, this smell is like that smell, because there's a lot of overlap, and therefore you get this. And the, the point is that this type of, you can imagine if this works, oh, let's use it as an algorithm for finding near neighbor surface, right? You, you have each smell is mapped to this random projection and cap subset of activity. You have a different smell, different activity. And now I get some new thing, and I want to map it to a familiar one. Well, I'll map it to the nearest neighbor after this projection. So, so these guys actually did that on a, on a computer and uh, found that this fruit fly algorithm beats uh, state-of-the-art algorithms for nearest, approximate nearest neighbor search on some data sets. So this has got, these data sets have got nothing to do with neuroscience. They're just find nearest neighbors in a database. But, but yet this very simple thing is able to practically beat them. So you know, evolution found something competitive here. Um, and now why? So the question is why? And so in 2018, you know, uh, early days, um, we were able to show this. <laughs> so this is what a formal statement of what's happening here looks like. Um, remember that we have cap A and B, which are subsets of size K, and they project to cap A and cap B. So if A and B overlap with probability with, with, with alpha, so the two sets A and B have an alpha fraction overlap. Then their projection, if they were completely random, because you're just picking k subsets, the overlap would only be k out of n, just linear, right? It's completely random. But instead, it's k over n to the power of one minus alpha or one plus alpha, which is less than one. So, for example, it might be like square root of k over n, much higher fraction. Okay. Uh, um, and in the setting of the fruit flies, if there's a half overlap in the input, there's a one third overlap in the in the in the in the projections. And from this very extremely simple sort of, sort of uh, oblivious uh, combination. Um, I think, so the, the, the idea is just that if you were involved, so if A was projecting to a cap, you know that the total input from here is high, that's what the cap is. And even though you don't know which ones are common, this gives you a little bias to the next input which has high overlap. And, and that's what you'd expect, and, and in fact is true. So uh, this is just a simulation, and indeed the theory, you know, are underlies, but doesn't quite reach how strong it turns out to be in simulation. Okay, so that's the starting point. Just the projection, no recurrent connections, no memories, no assemblies yet. And here's where we, it, it hopefully gets much more interesting. Does something similar happen in mammals? Yes, except that we also have recurrent connectivity and plasticity, and these two operations just take you, you know, much, much, much further along. Okay, as you'll see. So what does it look like for, 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 for a mouse or for, for me? Um, let's think of two areas. On the left is a sensory area. You know, maybe you're seeing something or smelling something. And there's some subset of neurons that fires. And as a result, somewhere else in a brain area, there's a top K because of whoever, the, the ones that receive the most input, they fire. Okay, great. What happens in the next step? The next step, these are both firing. Maybe you're still seeing the uh, external and the top K are firing. Now this determines a new top K, right? Because previously the top K was just determined by the external input. Now you have an internal top K and an external top K recurrent connection, so you have a new top K, great. And now these determine a new top K and so on, right? So it's not just projection, top K done. Top K, top K, top K, top K, right? And we have plasticity as well. Each time there's a firing activity, if I fired and J fired in the next step, their rate is going to increase. As a result of this, one might ask, will this even going to stabilize? Right? Will this even converge to anything? And the answer is yes. Um, as long as your plasticity is above a small uh, a threshold, uh, I'll, I'll put it down exactly, then the total number of neurons that will be touched in this process is just a little bit more than K. 
It's k plus little ok. Little ok is a function that's growing slower than k. In this case, it'll be like square root k. Okay. So, so the total number of neurons will touch will be. So it's not saying you'll converge to an exact fixed set of neurons, but it's saying, okay, you'll move a little bit. And at the end, you'll be stuck with those. So most of the neuron firing will be the same, but there'll be a few that'll go in arbitrary ways. Uh, and so this is an unusual fixed point theorem because if you go to mathematical literature, usually the fixed point theorem says you converge to a specific set or you converge to a specific distribution. Neither of those seems to be true in reality, and that's not what this is saying. Okay. Um, just to, in, in fact, as long as you have positive plasticity, there will be some convergence, although much weaker. Uh, and this the, the threshold is pretty small. It's not. It's not. A, it's not. A, it's not a huge threshold that you need to get strong convergence. In practice, it takes about a dozen steps. As you increase the, 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 the plasticity parameter, the convergence is much more rapid. These bottom graphs are for very high plasticity values. Yes? Uh, does that mean you can number I'm assuming that K neurons are firing, both in the input area and in the area in which the assembly is being created. So the numbers are k. So that we will fix them at k. In the input area, it kind of doesn't matter how many total neurons are there because it's just k firing. In the in the in this in the in the in the area where the assembly is creating created, it is important that it's k and n. The fun, the parameters do depend on both. The, the convergence depends on both k and n. And the p is the connection probability. So the, the convergence is affected by the density of the area, the num the, the cap, and the total number of neurons. Okay, and um, the proof here is a bit more complicated because you have to analyze this, uh, what happens in the, in the next step and why should it even converge and what does it converge to? Um, uh, um, uh, there is a nice game between this huge pool of neurons that have never won and this um, set of neurons that have been in previous caps and the analysis shows you how the number of new winners keeps diminishing till it becomes zero with high probability. Anyway, so I, I'll skip that. Um, okay, so that's projection and the creation of an assembly just by presentation of an input, right? This is a trivial problem on a computer. It stores something in, in a location. But on, in the brain, very different and, you know, it, it, without having to say store, it stores, creates a memory. Okay. Now, future presentations of the same or similar stimuli fire the assembly right away. You don't need to go through the whole, whole firing activity. What about firing the subset of the assembly itself? Yes, it suffices to have just a small subset fire, and what fraction needs to fire depends on how many times you've presented it. If you've presented it many times, then a smaller and smaller fraction of the assembly being excited is enough to ignite the whole thing in the next couple of steps. Okay? Because the, the internal density becomes higher and higher just because of plus. That's, that's, so that's, that's a formula here. And uh, another thing that comes out almost immediately is the following. Suppose you see two stimuli uh, co-occurring. Co and, and, and they have their assembly representations internally. But if you see them together a lot, the assemblies overlap more over time. Okay? This is provable in this model, uh, but there was this very inspiring experiment for us, uh, which uh, maybe many of you uh, know already. Let me just uh, go over it very quickly um, in, by Ison et al. And it did the following. So they were measuring several hundred neurons in the MTL. Um, uh, the patients, human human patients, and uh, uh, they were doing this in response to presenting specific images. So in the first round, they would give them images of famous places, and uh, about 10 to 20 neurons would fire out of this 600 that they are measuring, which is, which is how they extra you extrapolate what k is out of n. Great, consistently. Okay, and then uh, you know same for uh, uh, different places, different subsets of neurons. Great. Then they would also show them famous people, um, you know, um, um, without making, yeah. And uh, some other subset of neurons would fire with very little overlap. Great. Then they did this clever thing where they juxtaposed the person and the place. A, a combination that the, per, that the patient might never have seen before, likely never have seen before. I presented this a few, two, two times. Great. And then here's the punchline. They present the place again. And this time, some of the neurons that previously fired only for the person are also fired. Okay, so with enough 
simultaneous presentation activity, these neurons are, these assemblies are overlapping more, you know, in observable empirical conditions. Now this has been replicated uh, since, since this original experiment. Um, uh, Uh, something stuck. I must have forgotten to say something. Maybe if I. Ah, here we go. Thank you. Okay. Uh, so this uh, association does probably happen in this model. Merge is a more complicated operation. I'll, I'll skip it here. And just to recap the, 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 the assembly calculus, uh, we have the projection operation, we have association, we have pattern completion, merge, and some control commands. Uh, th these are the three important ones. Um, activate an assembly, read what is being, fi what is firing in an assembly area, disinhibit, which means from area A to area B, I don't want to allow any connection. So, you know, the, the activity is not allowed to propagate. How powerful is the system? So what can you, what kind of computation can you do with the system? And the answer is it can do arbitrary square root and space computations. So one of the, the highlights of the theory of complexity, computational complexity, is that we have a universal model, you know, the Turing machine. So anything that can be computed can be computed on a Turing machine. And what this is saying is that anything that a Turing machine can compute in square root n steps, we can simulate in this brain model, in square root n memory, sorry, it doesn't matter how many steps it takes, square root n memory, it can be simulated in this brain model with each area having n neurons, and we're only talking about six areas, or five areas, I forget exactly, a small number of areas. This is purely theoretical. It's no, no, I'm not proposing that the brain works this way, but it's just showing that there is a completeness there. It, it has the power to do it if you want. Um, and what does the program look like? It's not a program. It basically says, give me the sequence of inputs that correspond to the computation you want, and every once in a while, there will be this control command that says, disinhibit area A to area B, inhibit area A to area B, that kind of thing. That's it. That's the type of program. Those are still bothersome, the control commands. It would be ideal if we didn't have any of those. And we're working towards that. You know, a, a model that's truly just driven by external and internal activity and no program at all. Okay, so in the rest of this talk, I want to talk about learning with assemblies. So this is the brain's great trick, learning. Um, and moving away from this, for, for those that are more theoretically inclined, the model here said that the probability of an edge is P for every pair of edges. You know, this is the standard other uh, random graph model. So we know that the brain structure is different. Is that provably useful? And so on. A little bit about language, uh, um, uh, human language. Okay. Yes. This is what made it a long time. So thinking through all of this, how uncertainty might be captured in this model. So I'm thinking maybe there's overlap between the two assemblies. Let's say two phases that are kind of similar that might be taken one from the other. Is, is that how it works? Is it if there's overlap between the assemblies? And, and how is that? Because it feels a little deterministic aside from the randomness of the network. It feels like the optimal is, you know, very absolutely. So so yeah, so so uh, uh, great question. So uh, first of all, yes, the overlaps, you know, there, there's all kinds of overlaps. And certainly while this explains how one memory leads you to another memory and so on, it's still quite deterministic everything, except for the random, initial randomness, right? The operation is generous. Um, what we haven't modeled here yet, and it seems like it's gonna be very useful in the future, is that there is some amount of uh, uh, a random firing activity, random in quotes, uh, independent of, of, of what, is caused by previous previous firing activity. And that should be enough to tip you over one side or the other to make this public. So incorporating randomness, not in the definition of the graph, but in the actual operations as in a randomized algorithm, uh, you know, uh, uh, I think would be very important and interesting. Okay, so how do brains learn, right? Um, this is a crucial problem. Uh, the only op mechanism we have, we're having here is plasticity. The fact that the weight of a synapse is going up if J fires soon after I, that's it. If you did it, if you ask one of my colleagues, they would say, do gradient descent. Or why one of my colleagues, one of your colleagues, they would do gradient descent, right? You know, that, why would you do anything else? Does the brain do this? It's not clear at all. Um, so 
the, is synaptic plasticity an effective learning mechanism? Uh, or how is it? Okay. Um, so what I'm going to show you next is how we can do unsupervised learning with assemblies. What do I mean by this? So far, we've had one assembly per type of input. Oh, excuse me. Yeah. I did have two questions from the chat. Um, the first one is how does the inhibition work? Are two inputs activated at the same time, or is there a time difference for you? Right. So uh, in the model, no spikes, just fire or not fire at every step. Inhibition is abstracted away as saying that um, in each area, k neurons fire at each step. And those k neurons fire simultaneously. So it's discrete time steps. Yes. Um, the timing and sequence is fine. Ah. Uh, you said that uh, you only say whether it fires or not, it's a binary thing. But uh, in reality, when the timing and the sequence you're firing also happens. Oh, in your, in 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 in, in uh, experiments, of course. I mean, the, the the bursts of activity are very different from uh, neurons to neurons based on what is going on, and uh, the model hasn't reached the point where it's able to usefully distinguish different types of burst neuronal firing activity. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Yeah. We had a clarifying question in the last one, which is um, if two assemblies are active, then two times k neurons are active as a result. Okay, so each area can have one assembly fire, can have k neurons fire. Could be an assembly or not, but each area can have k neurons. So if you have a dozen areas, there could be a dozen assemblies firing one in each area. And then I have one more question for the chat, which is how small can any assembly be? I'm wondering if a weak play cell where a single neuron fires in response to a stimulus would be a one neuron. Yeah, but it's, it's a great question. In this simplified model, everything is just K. You know, the assembly size is also K. Uh, up to K neurons are allowed to fire. Um, but of course, you know, it's, yeah. So, so I have a more uh, lengthy response to how size of assemblies should and be allowed to vary, but, but, but uh, maybe I'll hold that for you. Okay. okay, so uh, so so far one input. You know, I see I see Hannah. I create an assembly. Great, right? Uh, I see Ming. I create an assembly. Great, but I want to create an assembly for uh, female neuroscientists. Okay, or uh, I want to create an assembly for uh, you know something else. Boxed lunches as opposed to each kind, right? So an assembly for a category, and we do that automatically without special intervention, right? Cats, dogs. And then, oh, I'm seeing a cat, not a dog, whatever, right? This is the famous uh, uh, machine learning experiment. So can we have assemblies for clusters, well-separated clusters of data? Um, that's what we'd like, right? And so here's the experiment. We're going to draw inputs from some nice distribution and uh, project to a single area. There'll be two different classes, or they could have more than two classes, classes of distributions. Each class will have a preference towards some some uh, uh, patterns, okay? So, uh, and I'll tell you exactly how. So we'll just see five examples from one class presented to this model, and then five examples from another class, five examples from third class, and so on. And at the end, what you're gonna say is, give me a new example from one of the classes. And you'd want, what you want is that after having seen the examples, you've created one assembly per class. And when you see a new example, the correct assembly file, because that's what you'd like, with no further manipulation. Okay, so, so that's what happens actually. And um, the overlap between the, the ones that actually fire within a class becomes you know, over 98% in these small experiments. And the overlap between uh, um, uh, firing activity for different classes becomes extremely small. Let me make this a little bit more precise. So what, is, what do I mean by stimulus class? It's a distribution over zero ones, right? Well, you know, N possible sensory neurons. And, uh, there is a core set, which we'll call this, this uh, 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 core of the stimulus, where you're, that represents, you know, those are the features that are more likely to be on for this stimulus class, say for cats. And the rest of it could still be on, but with a smaller probability. Okay, so about half of your neuro or constant fraction will come from this core set, the rest will come from the rest. And then you have a different class dogs, and that'll have a different core set, and, 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 and again, activity from everywhere. So things from the same core set will have more overlap. So if you have this, then with again, with sufficient plasticity, you'll get an assembly 
And now a new stimulus will take you to the correct first cap. Um, this is just showing you the firing activity of the top K neurons. And you'll see in the, at the input level, there's more overlap, but in the assembly, there's actually much less overlap between, uh, I mean, much more overlap within a class uh, uh, after, after the projection. So this is true for multiple classes. It allows you to classify. You can, you know, once you have an assembly you, to decide if it's a cat or a dog, you just see the total firing activity. If it's in this subset, that's a cat. If it's in that subset, it's a dog. You know, you don't have to do more than that. Um, okay, so even more, uh, uh, perhaps a little bit more um, theoretical, but general, is uh, what are called linear thresholds. Like, can you learn linear thresholds? Here you had really well separated plans. By linear thresholds, we mean, you know, if this combination of features is more than some value, it belongs to this category, otherwise it doesn't. Okay, if it's cloudy and you know, daytime and whatever, it's raining. Uh, anyway. So, um, uh, uh, so the way we'll, 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 we'll uh, set this up is that we'll have some half space or li a uh, a linear function. One side is the class, the other side is not the class, sort of a standard setup in machine learning. And you see examples from one side consecutively, and then you want to create an assembly for that so that when you see a new example, that assembly fires only if you see things from the same class, okay? So again, this happens. Um, surprisingly uh, uh, robustly. And um, the overlap after you do this projection is much higher within a class and much lower with the, for the class and its, and its complement. Okay, and I'm doing nothing under the hood. This is exactly what's happening as we, as we already described in the model. The plasticity is enough to drive you towards this well-created assembly that represents the class. So uh, this, this is uh, formally a theorem, I'll just skip over it, and you don't need uh, too, many, uh, uh, too much plasticity, you need only a few presentations, but you do need examples from the same class consecutively. If you had shown me cat, dog, cat, dog, cat, dog, I would learn nothing. But if you showed me cat, 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 and then you showed me dog, I've got two different assemblies. Okay, so that there is this mildly supervised as aspect. Okay, now, <laughs> Uh, I have a few minutes left, but this is perhaps this current work that seems to be quite exciting. One of the brain's great uh, abilities is, uh, or, or constraints is sequences. You know, we seem to do very well with sequences and, and how we do things. So here's a toy experiment. I'm gonna present not one stimulus, but a sequence of stimuli. A, B, C, D, or that, right? And, and in the input area, and present this a few times. I'm going to play this song a few times. Okay. What we'd like is that in your projected area, there should be a sequence of assemblies. Moreover, if I play the first one, it should just play out the rest without presenting the input, right? Now, like you've memorized the pattern. Or if I play the fifth one, if I tell you D, there's a D, E, F, whatever, you can play out the rest. And indeed, that uh, is exactly what happens. And um, theoretically, at least. Now, what I want to do is actually switch to a little demo. I'll give you, a, I think we have a few minutes, right? Yeah, okay. So that, you know, um, this doesn't stay completely abstract. Um, let me just point out that where, where this will go after, in case I don't get to come back to the talk, we run out of time. Um, beyond sequences, we can, you, you can memorize finite state automata, little rules that we all do, you know? If it's Monday and it's raining, I'm going to take the car, if you have, right, whatever. And all of this, you know, you can do this on our brain simulator available on GitHub, okay? Uh, with very little knowledge of neuroscience <laughs> or, or machine learning. Um, probabilistic finite automata, we don't know yet how to do. This relates to your question. Uh, uh, you know, how, how do you get random, some randomness, but still with patterns happening? What we can do is simulate a general Turing machine now without control commands. And we don't need this disinhibit inhibit. We're going to just present sequences of inputs, and the hardware will let you compute what you want. Okay. Um, okay. Um, uh, um, in the rest of the talk, I was going to talk about how to explain the fact that and, and utilize the fact that the connectivity in the in the in the connectome is not purely random. In fact, there are clusters. There's there, there's patterns to it and uh, local, local uh, motifs that seem to be useful. Um, this is something that uh, a student here 
um, uh, Mirabel Reed has been studying and, and having uh, some great success with. Um, uh, maybe we'll get here, maybe we won't, but otherwise, uh, 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 let me um, go to the demo. Uh, and the way I have to do this, I think, is um, go back to screen share. And I want to share. Okay, hopefully, hopefully you can see this um, online too. This is just a Jupyter um, a notebook with uh, some simple code. And you see, this is setting up a brain. I mean, it's kind of nice that you can say from brain import brain area. Uh, you know, and, um, and, and you know, you can see the sizes of the neurons are pretty small. And the first thing we'll do is projection. Um, and then let's plot. Um, uh, because of Zoom, it always takes a little bit more time. But you see, there's four different stimulus classes. And this is showing you sorted according to, you know, uh, which ones are firing. But you can see there's clear distinction among the stimulus classes. Um, that's projection. And now, um, you know, you, you, let's reset. Let's have four labels. And we can see what actually fires in response to specific activity. And you get this. You know, this, this is after presenting basically five stimuli each from each class. Okay, great. Um, th those, are the, those are the stimuli. And then we, we will present these and look at what uh, the training was done already. This is, this is what actually got, th these are the, this is the firing activity, the corresponding assemblies in the thousand area, thousand neuron brain area. Okay, um, now you can, uh, Test it. You know, is it actually going taking you to the right uh, to the right uh, assembly when you give it a new input? And yes, it is, as you would expect, because the, the assemblies are so consistent. Um, uh, yeah, you know, these accuracy will be the same, so I won't print them. Uh, half space test. We 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 did this. Um, maybe I'll skip the half space test um, and go instead to uh, sequences. This is what the half space test looks like. I presented five examples from one half space. So it's, you get this consistent assembly. When you give it an example that's not from this, you just get a distributed firing and not from the assembly. Okay, so it's able to say, you know, elephant or not elephant. That historically in machine learning, elephant and non-elephant is a very important example. I think that's the reason hack learning took off, but anyway. Um, uh, okay, so sequence learning, okay? This is what I just claimed. Uh, let's define a sequence. And we're going to present the sequence just 10 times. So A, B, C, D, F, G, A, B, C, D, F, G. Okay. And it's a, it's a sequence of length 10. It's not trivial. Okay. Now uh, let's plot the input sequence as well as the uh, sequence that was actually created. Uh, this will take a second, mainly because of Zoom. If you do it on your laptop, it'll be instant. Um, I'm happy to take questions, of course, but here it is. This is the input sequence. You know, we've defined these. Uh, these are the these are the A, B, C, D, E, F, G corresponding sensory area neurons. This is what has been created in the in the brain. There is some overlap, you notice, but it's mostly distinct. Okay, uh, so that's great. Now recall, which means I just fire the first one and ask what happens in the brain. If I fire just the first one in this brain area, I should say. Okay, so the first one fired, and that leads you to the se entire sequence getting recalled. Okay, um, now here is something interesting that I would very much like to explain. Um, uh, uh, let me run it and talk about it for a second. You know how when you're trying to memorize something, it's much nicer to memorize it alongside a pattern you already have in mind. You know, if you want to learn A, B, C, D, E, F, G, you teach it to a song. Okay, if you want to learn you know, how to go somewhere, you map it to something you already know. And this seems to be very useful. It seems like we can actually, in this model, explain why that's the case. Um, here, what we're gonna do is instead of copying, instead of presenting the sequence and creating an assembly in just one area, I'm actually gonna have it in two areas, okay? And they will scaffold each other. 
And, and as a result, it will turn out that the recall is more accurate, measurably even here, and you need fewer presentations. You're just in this at this level of experiment, yes. Yeah. Yes. Oh, uh, no, no. Uh, recurrent connections are crucial throughout this entire presentation. So within the area, we have recurrent connections. Uh, um, uh, what's happening is that when you present this A, B, C, D, E, A has an assembly, B has an assembly, but because B came right after A and assembly B fired right after assembly B, the connections are getting strengthened so that when you let it loose, a fires B, fires C, fires D, that's what's happening. And what all I'm showing in this scaffold uh, uh, experiment is that because you've created, you know, from your original sequence, A, B, C, D, E, you've created assembly A and assembly, so this is A1 and A2 and B1 and B2, but you've set up connections like this as well. When I fire just A1, the auxiliary setup is helping you fire this more accurately. Yeah. And in, even in these small experiments, it's about a factor of two more accurate. So yes, it's better to teach a tile the alphabet with a song. Uh, science proves, yeah, okay, okay. <laughs> um, okay, um, now uh, there's more here uh, about copied sequences and how well it does. Let me skip to maybe the most uh, state-of-the-art experiment that uh, Max has uh, gave me, sent me last night. Okay, this is on the notebook. So finite state machine. I'm going to imprint a finite state machine in your head. How? Just by playing out its activation. That's all. I will tell you, if you are in this state and you see this input, you go to this state. Okay, I will do that for each arc of this finite state machine. For example, this one which counts, which, which, which checks whether a given string has an even number of ones. Okay, and How do we do it? We just play it one arc at a time. These are the transitions. And we're creating internally assemblies, one per arc, that's it. No, no pre preset things. And now we're gonna give it a new string and it should accept only if it has an even number of, even number of uh, ones, uh, zeros, I forget which one, whichever it was, zeros. Okay, so you see this? The string was one, zero, zero, one, zero, zero, one. And one zero zero, so it had four zeros, so it should accept. And look at the firing activity. It changes state whenever it moves to a different uh, number. And indeed, at the end, it was back at this state, which is even, so it accepts. Um, uh, and you didn't have to do anything except play out the arcs and it memorized it for the finite state machine for you. Okay, so I mean, this is about the limit of our abilities, right? To learn fixed rules. But <laughs> yeah, anyway, so you can do this for more complicated ones, for example. Is the number of ones e, uh, multiple of three? Uh, okay, I'll, I'll uh, go back uh, to the talk for the last minute. And um, uh, I think you may not be able to see the full version on there, but it's okay. Uh, there's not too much to go. Here is the type of problem that I want to highlight, the mathematical problem, which is you have this brain area with K firing neurons. And then the next step, another K fire, the, the ones that receive the most input, the ones that receive the most input. Does this process converge? What we've shown is with plasticity, yes. Without plasticity, it seems like a very interesting, but not entirely clear how, how important it is for the brain. Seems like a very interesting mathematical question to understand these dynamics. Um, and there, here, what, what Mirabel showed is that if the graph has like an additional structure, like it's a geometric random graph, which has more likely, edges are more likely if the vertices are closer to each other in some space, then you don't need plasticity or you need less plasticity. Um, okay, so this, 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 that's what this simulation is showing. Um, right, and some very interesting phenomena happens. It doesn't actually converge. It converges to a small subset within which there's, there's a pattern of oscillation, okay? It, it's not just going to going down to the same neurons firing. So it's more complex activity, such as we see in many experiments in neuroscience. Finally, language, <laughs> perhaps the most interesting thing to study for the brain, because it's a last minute adaptation. And we think, you know, it adapted to the brain strengths. And really, language utilizes the brain strength. So it's, it should be a fantastic lens for studying the brain. And this is the last experiment I want to show. 
Um, look at this sequence of words in case you haven't seen it before. Fret, ship, hill, give, true, melt, fans, blue, guess, it's, then nonsense, right? Cats. And what do you see when you do gross firing activity? Uh, one peak at uh, four hertz, which is basically the rate at which you absorb a word. You recognize words, single words. Now, here's what they did. These guys are so clever, right? These neuroscientists. Bad cats eat fish, new plan gave joy, little boy kicks ball. What do you think will happen now in terms of firing activity? There are three different spikes, frequencies. The four hertz for every word. There's also a two hertz and a one hertz. What do you think those are? Yeah, little phrases for the two words and the entire little sentences for the one hertz, okay? So your brain is building little parse trees on the fly. What else could it be doing? And we know now how to build parse trees with assemblies in about a dozen steps. <laughs> Don't believe me, but okay. The completion of phrases and, and sentences leads to, uh, you know, activates part of Broca's area is, is something that, that we do know. And, and this is what's happening. So here is a model of how, you know, you might be parsing the world. You, you activate assemblies in your lexicon, which form verb phrases, assemblies, and then sentence assemblies, and they can go backward and generate. There are very interesting questions. Uh, related to the assembly calculus itself. What is an assembly is an existential and important question, I think. Uh, but uh, there are also more general uh, research directions that I'm excited about. I don't want to take too long, so I'll stop here. Thanks very much, and I think making it for this example is fine. Um, so coming back to the earlier question, we talked about the probabilistic part of the network, but still the calculus of the network is being yeah, classified, right? And I'm curious about situations where you say, oh, I think that's been a post, but I'm not, but I'm 50% sure it could be someone else, I'm not sure. But you know, we attach confidence levels in the location. Yeah, excellent. Yeah. So in fact, you know, there seems to be this whole predictive nature to how our brains work. Like we always have this model of what's what's happening even before we have it, right? So one example that struck me a lot is how we actually parse an image. You know, there's this constant saccading where we we, we, we eye look for another eye, look for a nose, look back to the eye. And there is some variation in how exactly even though you do it the same time. Uh, what I I think the way to go to adapt this, the model currently doesn't have this probability built in, but I think there's a simple way to do it, which is to have basically a small number of neurons or small uh, probability of firing activity for all, all over the place. It seems to be the simplest way to do it. So that if you have closed ties where you're unsure, it's just randomness that's for letting you choose one way or the other. That seems to be like a benign way to do it till something more compelling. Oh, good. Yeah. So, so the, the what I showed you with stimulus classes, you can run on MNIST, say with the, with the digits, and it will give you 96% um, accuracy. It won't give you the 99 point whatever, but it'll do better than a linear classifier on a, you know, thousand neuron. Uh, um, yeah. 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 Right, right. So good. Yeah. So so it's it's a it's a matter of how much plasticity you used in the first place and how different the next uh, distribution is. So indeed, it, it, we it is it is very much a, a lifelong learner. You know, it's it's a, it's a it's it's a gradual learner, right? So you present the first class, it creates an assembly. That's why you need examples from one class, and then you present the second class, it creates a second assembly, assuming the second class is sufficiently different from the first. And and once it does that, these are consistent and and, and different. 
But if the second class is close enough to this, you can have a mess where it both under, yeah. And one more question. If, um, you put up the yeah, so what we can prove is the following. So it's, it's a very interesting question. Um, that you know you're, you're, you're only k neurons are allowed to fire. It's not that it converges to a subset k and that's it. What happens is that it converges in such a way that the total number of neurons that will ever fire over time is k plus a little bit. Okay, so which means that the same set of neurons are firing most of the time because k are firing every time. And there's a few neurons that are in an arbitrary pattern, which we don't know the pattern. Of. Now, in fact, what's been observed is that as you reduce the plasticity lower and lower and even make it zero or, or close to that, you can have uh, or, uh, convergence to different types, like two subsets, A, B, A, B, A, B, with a little bit of odd sum. And exactly when that happens and for, under what conditions is, is, is unclear. Right. Maybe, yeah, I don't know how to connect it at least. Yeah, it's supposed to be. Yeah. In the back. Oh, okay. Uh, this sequence stuff was what, super cool. And uh, one thing I'm wondering is that the, the dynamics of running the sequence must be defined by the trajectory of one assembly. You have two sequences that cross. Your model resolve that. Yeah, that, that's a good question. So right now, um, um, as Garrett also mentioned, deterministic. So as long as I have only one out degree, like, you know, you can have two sequences that meet and then continue together. That's okay. Yeah. Because if there, as long as the, there's well-defined output for sequence, it will be learned, right? Yeah. But, yeah. but if, if you have a divergent behavior, you know, when you reach a particular point, you might continue, like in language, you might continue the sentence this way or that way. Yeah. You need, you really need some, some way to incorporate this. And at the moment, we don't have it. Yeah. It, it only replaces deterministic behavior. Yeah. Is that, uh, reducible firing rate neurons? And what is the static? Hmm. Uh, yeah, so there's only one universal time constant at the moment now, which is one, you know, fire in each. There's a, there's a single clock for everything. We're not utilizing the fact that we know from neuroscience there's multiple clocks. Uh, we're not utilizing different firing rates. Um, uh, or, or, or variable firing rates. Um, yeah, all this is built on just uh, uh, single firing rates. And the inhibition does depend on, I mean, the K cap does depend on inhibitory neurons integrating faster. Yeah, so that's <laughs> Like, <laughs> yeah, <a little> <laughs>